Hello, I have a Mercedes E-Class of the W211 generation and I have fitted an Android Auto head unit. You might want to do the same in your W211 Mercedes or potentially in a CLS or G-Class of the same generation. And in this video, you'll find out what it's actually like to live with an Android head unit. And at the end of the video, I'm going to cover installation as well. So let's get straight into it. First of all, Android head units have a horrible reputation. People say that either the volume is quite low when you're listening to music, Bluetooth cuts out, um, the manuals are poor, the screen is laggy, and so on and so forth. But yet, I went ahead and bought one anyway, so either I'm crazy, stupid. The litmus test for any head unit is how well Apple CarPlay or Android Auto works. In this case, I have tried both, but personally, I use Apple CarPlay. So let's get inside my car. So here you can see I'm in the car, ignition is off, power is off, and I have my phone. And I'm gonna switch on ignition, and just like that, you can see that it's starting to connect. So wirelessly, it takes between 20 to 30 seconds um, for CarPlay to start. That might sound a little bit long, but by the time you've strapped your own belt and waited for the kids to buckle their belts, Android Auto or CarPlay will be ready. What's great about this car is that Apple CarPlay starts automatically. I don't need to unlock the phone. I don't need to press a button on the infotainment. I can keep the phone in the pocket and CarPlay will start automatically. In some cars, that's not the case. So this is fantastic if you're in a rush, like you don't even need to think about launching CarPlay, you just get in the car and it's there. And it's also amazing if you don't like the Android interface of your head unit, because when you get in the car, it will just show you the loading screen for CarPlay. You won't actually see the, the interface itself. So that means that you essentially, all you see is CarPlay, which is really good. And, um, and is it responsive? I think it's responsive enough. It's probably comparable to an Amazon Fire tablet, but that's okay. I'm not playing Call of Duty in the car. So if the response isn't, it, yeah. But that's fine. I don't play Call of Duty Mobile on the infotainment, so therefore I don't need the sharpest response. Um, so if you're okay with an Android Fire tablet, you'll be okay with this one as well. Um, and the screen quality is similar to an Android Fire tablet as well. And it's not really a problem because most of the time your eyes are looking towards the road, not on to the screen. And uh, responsiveness is faster if you use the wired connection. And um, the wired connection is a bit quicker as well. Um, it connects to the phone in roughly four or five seconds. And it's unfappable as well. Like you can unplug and plug the phone back in multiple times and it will connect every single time. So CarPlay is super reliable in this car. And when you're changing songs or scrolling through playlists, it's also a little bit snappier when it's wired for obvious reasons, because it's not streaming over Wi-Fi. And if you've also downloaded songs, then it will change songs a bit quicker as well. But overall, the wireless setup, I'm more than happy with it. And I have 4G and 5G, so connectivity isn't really an issue. So there you have it. CarPlay in this car works absolutely like it would if you had it installed from factory, maybe even better. Okay, so now that we've covered that, um, to give you a little bit of context, my car came with the Audio 20 stereo. The other option is an Harman Kardon one. So the Audio 20, some of them have AUX depending on your options and some don't. Mine did not have AUX or Bluetooth. It does have a phone cradle for an old Nokia and you can buy a Bluetooth adapter for around 100 pounds on eBay. Um, but apparently that will be for voice only, not music. Um, so my only option for Bluetooth streaming was to 
solder like an AUX connection into the stereo, but I didn't want to do any soldering. And I also heard that some people who've done it, the audio quality isn't perfect. There's a bit of static noise as well. Um, so therefore I thought I have nothing to lose. I love music and therefore I'm going to spend 160 pounds on an Android head unit. In its most modern form, we can look towards the model Tesla 3. There is one screen and that screen serves as your instrument cluster, speedometer and your infotainment as well. Everything is controlled through that screen. So in that car, we will unlikely see third party options for head unit because the systems and everything is so integrated into the car that it will be practically impossible for third party companies to figure out how to create a third party option but also tesla might have locked down the software as well then we have the hybrid type where the music um, controls for heating and car functions and the speedometer or combined either either all three or two of them and um, these are the types of head units where you could do an upgrade, but there's also risk that you could lose some of the car's functionality, whether it's access to massage seats. And this is where you need to have a lot of faith that the third party manufacturer has made sure that every single function that worked on the previous screen or using physical controls is going to work through the interface that they have produced. And more likely than not, this will be more expensive options um, by Kenwood or Sony, and less likely to be from options that you might find on eBay or AliExpress. And then we have the third type, which is cars like mine that have a head unit that's basically just a stereo. It's a stereo. Um, and in some situations, they do receive information from the car because they're plugged into to, to the car's CAN bus network. So the CAN bus network is essentially the car's nervous system through which it logs errors, faults, and whereby if you press a, a volume up button on the steering wheel, that unique signal gets picked up in the CAN bus network and the stereo understands that you are asking for the volume to be increased. Um, but it really works two ways. So the car communicates with the head unit and not vice versa. And the beauty of these systems is that the infotainment is easy to replace because it's just stereo. So if you take the stereo out of the car, all the functionality of the car will still work except for the music. And that also makes the job easier for third party manufacturers because all they need to do is to create a stereo. They don't need to understand that much about the car. And it also results in like, if there are any niggles where the infotainment doesn't work that well, it's not really a bother because it's, it's not gonna result in you not being able to switch on and off the heated seats or to go into the gearbox settings or anything like that. The infotainment is basically independent from the car. And with the Android head units, it's a stereo with a screen on it. It's an Android tablet with plugs for your car. That is what it is. And for the W211 generation, there's lots of options now. I went for one that has a seven inch screen and that looks incredibly OEM. So when my car is switched off, you can't even tell that I have an Android head unit. It looks seamless and I've even replicated the buttons um, for the phone, but, it, but in this case, the buttons in my car are more for radio presets. But they've done a good job making it look like for like, and that is good for me because I love the interior design of this car. It's been on my bucket list as far as Mercedes cars are concerned. I love like the T-shaped inlays and how they swoop around the side. This and the interior of the CLS of the same generation are one of my most favorite interiors of all times. I really love it. There are other infotainment choices as well. 
I have come across some that have nine inch screens and this is why I purchased mine this summer. But then recently I've come across some that have 10 inch screens and even 12 inch screens that protrude out. So you can pick and choose. And I also chose this specific one because I thought that the um, physical buttons would be a nice fallback if the touchscreen isn't that responsive. And it's been great because if I want to skip songs, I have muscle memory, I can just press a button and also the volume knob before quickly want to dial down the volume instead of using uh, buttons on the steering wheel, I can just quickly turn it down and also my passengers as well. So it's nice to have that fallback in case uh, uh, things don't work as expected. And the last thing I would want is to be on the motorway or, or I'm reversing and I need to turn down the volume, but the touchscreen isn't responding for some reason. And I'm just like screaming at myself, but in this case, turning it all down is a nice fallback to have. I paid £160 for mine and um, prices can fluctuate a little bit and specs do improve with time. Um, there's no specific reason why I purchased this one. It wasn't the cheapest, it wasn't the most expensive one, but I figured I should buy one that's moderately powerful just to minimize the risk of things being sluggish. Um, but you may find now that you could buy one for a bit less or even a bit more. But overall, it's a beautiful thing that it's possible to buy one for under £200. I know that some of you do not care about CarPlay. What if you listen to radio? Radio is good in this car. It's really, really good. Um, the antenna, it works. The presets work. The sound quality is good as well. So there's no loss there because there are head units where the audio quality when you're listening to radio might be degraded. But in my car, the quality of radio has definitely improved. And um, it's nice to have the shortcuts. They work as advertised as well. And no complaints there. If you're geeky, Android head units have a lot of customization options. This one has a 5G SIM card slot. And you also have the opportunity to install apps, Spotify, Google Maps, lots of others. It's an Android tablet, so the world is your oyster. There's lots of different apps to, to download depending on how far you want to take it. I've only used the native interface a couple of times. And as you can see, it looks aftermarket. I don't love the way that it looks. Um, there are two different launches available and the launchers means look and feel, uh, but you can also download others online as well. And um, it is really the type of infotainment where if you want to run everything on the car without having to rely on the phone, it's really good for it. So you can even have a USB with your own music on it, plug the USB, drive into it and you'll be able to play those songs through the head unit. And um, I tried the native navigation on the head unit once and then did not do it again. It's incredibly laggy, it's detailed, there's 3D buildings and all of that, but it was incredibly laggy. And if you have CarPlay or Android Auto, it's surplus to requirements really. I'm a busy man and usually when I get into the car, I need to be somewhere, either pick up the kids or drive somewhere and I don't have time to faff around with settings or things that are not working properly and that's where Android Auto and CarPlay are brilliant. You just get into to the car, everything works identically every single time and you drive off. So I haven't really explored that much because I also try to link up the head unit to my Wi-Fi network at home because I park on the driveway but I couldn't get it to work. And there are many forums online where you can find tips and tricks and download various upgrades and software. But I don't want to tinker with the head unit. And that's because customer service is poor. The manuals themselves are not great. They're missing information. There are grammatical errors. Uh, words are jumbled. And therefore, if you start to flash the firmware and do other bits and bobs, 
and it breaks the system or breaks something, you're really on your own. So my strategy was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I purchased this mainly to have a Bluetooth connection to play music. I got a lot more, I got CarPlay, therefore I should be happy with that. So I'm unlikely to do any tinkering with it whatsoever. But if you do so, be very careful because the seller will not be able to offer you that much customer service either because they buy them from factories. Um, they don't provide a lot of information themselves and also the sellers don't necessarily have experience with the head units either compared with if you buy a car with a head unit fitted from factory if it has issues you go back to the dealership and you know that people in the dealership that have experience with that head unit with the car and are able to fix any software or hardware issues but with the android head units that's not the case so be incredibly careful with tinkering the single biggest surprise with this head unit is the amplifier i did not expect it to come with an amplifier that's better than the stock one and this is actually a high-end amplifier as a result music sounds phenomenal in the car the stock amplifier is four times 20 watts this one is four times 40 watts but it also has a digital audio processor as well. And that means that it comes with an EQ. It's genuinely good, really, really good. And if you combine that with CarPlay, streaming music at high quality and bitrate via Wi-Fi, the bump in sound is exceptionally high, really high. Um, and that makes this whole purchase even more worthwhile because I don't just get Bluetooth. CarPlay, but you also get an improved amplifier without having to buy a separate amp that needs to be wired in and all of that. And uh, because the amp is relatively high end, I mean, relatively, I know there's going to be some audio fans in the comments getting angry with me, but by regular standards, it is quite high end. I also took the opportunity to then upgrade my front speakers, also install a spare wheel subwoofer. I am going to share separate videos for those, so please look out for them on my channel. Overall, I'm super pleased with the head unit. It's great. It's worked better than advertised for £160. Um, the sound is great. The screen is good. CarPlay and Android Auto work seamlessly. And I have zero complaints. And I have zero complaints. So what about for yourself? Should you buy an Android head unit? I say yes. So if you've never upgraded the head unit in a car before, the first thing I recommend you do is that you take apart your current head unit and look behind it. So before ordering parts online, it's good to do your research. I know that it's easy to look at spec sheets and ask people like, what's my head unit, etc., etc. But sometimes manufacturers have variations depending on where you live, the model year, the engine, and also the trim. Therefore, the best thing to do is to just take apart your current head unit, look behind it, take pictures of the cavity, of your cables, and of the pins. That means that when you look for a head unit online, you be able then to check and ask questions to find out whether or not the one you want will fit in your car. And this is also a good experience for you just to get comfortable with taking things apart in the car. It might seem intimidating, but cars are designed to be taken apart. They're not made in factories. They're actually made in assembly plants, assembly as in Lego. It's just pieces being put together and they can easily be taken apart. The best tools to have for taking apart a car is to have a T20 screw. I purchased a T20 screw as part of this screw bit set that I keep in my car. It's compact, it comes with a lid and a box, and it's small enough to keep in the boot of your car. That means that if you need to tinker, it's always there in the car and you don't need to go into the house, look for screwdrivers, bring things in and out, misplace them. But no matter where you are, if something breaks or you need to fine tune, you're gonna have that, um, 
you're gonna have the requisite screwdrivers in the car. Another tool that's good to have is a trim removal tool. This is like a crowbar for prying off trim and plastic pieces inside the car. Luckily, with my car, you don't actually need that trim removal tool in order to um, remove the head unit. So in the W211, I recommend um, having a couple of tea towels or hand towels to bring with you in the car as well. And that will allow you to rest the head unit or any parts on there or put the tea towels between different parts to prevent things from getting scratched when you take an items apart or resting them if they're dangling. Um, so the tea towel is quite good. Some sellers of head unit, they include detailed pictures of everything that's included, all the cables or the harnesses and pins. So have a look at those pictures, but also watch a couple of YouTube videos as well, just to familiarize yourself with the head unit and also the process of taking things apart in your car. It looks intimidating, but it really isn't. And with these head units, they are typically only a stereo with a screen on it. So therefore, it's not going to affect the functionality of your car, whether it's gearbox, brakes, or engines. They are just independent from all of that. So that should give you a peace of mind. Taking things apart is often quite easy. Well, you might encounter some hurdles is putting things back in depending on the car. Um, so always account for a little bit of extra time for any minor frustrations. Usually um, something might be difficult to put back the first time, but then when once you've learned how to put it back, second, third or fourth time will be a lot easier. I have probably accessed my head unit about four times in this car and it's incredibly easy. Um, so do allow yourself extra time. Don't try to cram in this work like one hour before you're going to leave on holiday with the family or in the evening, 30 minutes before sunset. So allocate a decent amount of time. And if you have family or kids, just let them know you need some headspace to get some work done. You now join me in my car and I'm going to show you how to disassemble the center console. I'm not going to go all the way, but I'm just going to show you how to get started and how to put back the most frustrating pieces. Instead of tea towels, I have brought some t-shirts that I'm going to use to line on the side of the center console. And the first thing we're gonna do is to pop open this, and then we're going to pull. That's what you do, you yank, and you might need to have to do so a little bit firmly. And then you're gonna feel on the gear selector, and there's a retainer which you need to twist it's like a screw i think it should be clockwise anti-clockwise i always forget let me try anti-clockwise and then you pull up and that should remove this so this is the reason why we have tea towels here to prevent anything from getting scratched so we're going to lay that to the side um, and here you can see the linkage and the next thing we're going to do is to pull this off like that and then we lift it and it gets put towards the side and that's how easy it is um, and then the next step is to take your t20 torque screw and unscrew this pit here, this panel that has the warning triangle. So it will be two screws, one on each side, and then it comes out. And then the next step is to unscrew the infotainment itself. There's one screw there and one screw there. And that's accessed uh, with a screwdriver. But I'm not gonna do that because that is quite easy. So the bit that I struggled with was to put this back. Um, because it's a little bit awkward. So now you can see it in reverse, the way that it goes in. It goes in like that. So I'm gonna do it again, like that. That's the piece, that's the part that took me about 15, 20 minutes to figure out. And then all you do 
is to try to close the lid. It's a bit hard. And then you pop that back in, check that it works. And then the next stage, next step is to put this gear selector surround back. You, so this is the way it goes in. It goes in like that. And then you push it down. And just like that, it's back. It's back on. That is how easy it is to get started. You don't even need a screwdriver. So if you have a W211, give this a try because it's going to give you a little bit more confidence with regards to um, taking things apart in the car. That's it. Before you start disassembling the car, before you start disassembling the head unit in order to before you start disassembling the center console in order to fit a head unit, I recommend watching three or five videos on YouTube of other people who have done exactly the same thing. Um, there's lots of other videos out there and that's a little bit of a rule of thumb that I adhere to myself. So once I had plugged in the new head unit, did it work? Nope, it didn't work. And if this happens to you, don't be alarmed. It usually means that you simply forgot to plug something in. And in my situation, that's exactly what happened. Um, I had plugged in the power harness, um, but the head unit wasn't powering on and I couldn't understand why. I contacted the seller and they weren't really that good at explaining. So I did a little bit of research and I found out that there is a red accessory cable that comes out of the head unit. And that one is meant to be plugged in to the 12 volt socket. And the reason is when you plug in a new head unit, what you don't want to happen is that the head unit is on when the car isn't powered on, uh, because that will mean that the head unit will drain the battery. So the purpose of an accessory cable is for it to serve like a wake up cable, where if you have an accessory port that's only powered on, when the ignition is switched on, um, then that signal from the 12 volt socket is gonna go to the head unit and tell it to wake up. And that way the head unit is only on when ignition is on and therefore your battery will not be drained. So I ended up plugging that into the back of the 12 volt socket, as you can see in this picture here. Um, and I didn't need to like cut any of the existing cables, but I simply open this slot that already has three cables and I tucked in the red cable um, into the slot for the cable that's white and red. Um, and that's all I had to do. Annoyingly, the red cable is a bit short and became dislodged when I pieced everything back together. And therefore I needed an extension cable. And I had a 12 volt charger at home that I wasn't using and I simply cut cut it so that I got a um, wire that's like 20 centimeters long and I tied one end to the red accessory cable and then the other end I tucked it into the 12 volt socket in the same position as the red accessory cable here um, and then I put everything back and just like that the head unit was working and it was beautiful However, I did run into another problem, and that is that on my steering wheel, I have controls for volume and also for picking up the phone and, and hanging up a call. However, those buttons were not working. On the head unit, there is an app, app that allows you to map those keys to specific functions um, for the head unit. So if I don't wanna use the phone buttons for answering and hanging up, I can basically map those to skip a song or to rewind. Um, and there's an app for that in the head unit, but it wasn't working. Uh, and I was wondering um, whether the CAN bus cables were connected, because at the back of the head unit, there are two CAN bus cable. One says CAN high and one says CAN low. And those plug into the cars can bus system and you can usually tap into that system um 
via cable that that are either in the dashboard or towards the side down by the door seal either on the driver's side or passenger side um, and i was thinking yeah sure um i need to find out where they are in my car so i did some research and i couldn't quite find a simple answer because depending on the model year the um, can low and can high wires they, they can be anywhere like dashboard left or right side or underneath the seat. And I wasn't keen on ripping up the carpet in the car. And that then got me thinking, why are the buttons not working? And there are CAN bus cables at the back, but then I have a power harness and the power harness that plugs into the back of the head unit is identical to the one that I use for the original head unit. And with the original head unit, I could change volume up and down on the steering wheel and it worked. So that means that that power harness must have wires for CAN bus built in. And I had a look at the wiring diagram and I had a look at the power harness and I was correct. There are already CAN bus connections in that power harness. So therefore the two extra wires for CAN bus are redundant and this goes back to what i mentioned earlier is that with these head units you get a lot more cables than you actually need so then i had a look around online because i couldn't understand like why the um buttons on the steering wheel were not working for volume up and down and then deep down in the internet somewhere on a forum i discovered that a solution to this problem is to factory reset and i wasn't quite convinced because i was thinking i've bought gadgets before and I've never had to factory reset anything in order to access a function uh, um, that should be default. But either way, I factory reset and to my surprise, volume up and down worked. They worked instantly and I was happy. Um, answering the phone and hanging up, those buttons do not work. And neither was I able to map them. It's not that big of a downer because I knew that with the head units that are Android based, some things might work, some things might not work. So I was willing to accept a few uh, niggles uh, um, that come with ownership. But that's a little bit of insight. So if anything isn't working as it should with your head unit, do a factory reset. Because when I did a factory reset, I was also able to access um, another launcher that I wasn't able to access before. So highly recommend a factory reset. Um, and overall, that is uh, um, all that I have to say about um, upgrading from Audio 20 to an Android head unit. Should you do it in 2024? Absolutely, yes. For me, it cost £160 and it was totally worth it. Um, it's very sophisticated. It receives a lot of information from the car through the CAN bus network, such as steering wheel angle and you and you can uh, see that when you're reversing and uh, it also receives information about which doors are open whether the boot is open as well as whether it's night or daytime and you can see that reflected in the night and day modes in um, apple maps um, so overall it's very good i highly recommend one and if you have any questions please ask in the comment section and feel free to share your own experience. Like and subscribe. Thank you very much.